On August 7, 2008, at 11.35 p.m., the Georgian military launched an attack on South Ossetian territory by firing smoke bombs, then opening fire on South Ossetian forces. On the 8th of August, 2008, Georgian troops launched an assault on the South Ossetian capital, Skhinvali. After Georgian troops managed to secure the area around Skhinvali, they were attacked by Russian forces, resulting in a five-day war. This video will analyze the Russian and Georgian perspectives of the 2008 war. The predominant documents used for this video are the EU's official document on the matter, the Independent International Fact-Finding Mission on the Conflict in Georgia, and the UN Charter, which explains the conditions for national self-defense. As always, our full bibliography is provided in the video's description. Under the Russian Empire and Soviet Union, Russian leaders created a sphere of Russian influence in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, dubbed the Near Abroad. The USSR became a global superpower, rivaling the US with its cultural and political might. This came to an inglorious end in 1991, when the USSR was dissolved. Since the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, Russia has been attempting to reassert itself as a global power player through the use of hard power, the military, and soft power, orthodox ties, electoral interference, and social media influence. Since rising to power in 2000, Russian President Vladimir Putin promised the Russian people economic stability and political prowess. First, showing his capabilities to Russians during and after the Chechen Wars. Later, as many post-Soviet countries began looking west, Putin was forced with the decision to either attempt to keep post-Soviet countries within Russia's sphere of influence, or let them go and turn Russia into a European-style state. Putin increasingly chose the former. In 2003, three newcomers to Georgian politics rose to prominence. Nino Burjanadze, Zurab Zhvania, and Mikhail Saakashvili. Saakashvili and his team of young reformers offered the Georgian people a new future with an orientation towards NATO, the EU, and the United States, and therefore represented a change of guard from the old Soviet past towards a new youthful Western future. By 2008, Georgia was solidly on a pro-Western course, with the country claiming itself to be a staunch American ally and its leaders making declarations for NATO and EU membership for Georgia. Additionally, Georgia was receiving international recognition as the world's best democratic reformer, while simultaneously advancing the country's infrastructure at a breathtaking speed. In the months prior to August 2008, Russia began amassing military equipment in its bases in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. From April to June 2008, Russia sent its Abkhaz bases 40 howitzer tanks, 120 anti-tank missiles, two new helicopters, and nearly 200 military, aviation, and defense experts. Throughout July 2008, Russia also began sending in anti-aircraft systems, artillery guns, and armored vehicles to its military bases in the North Caucasus and South Ossetia. From July 15th through August 2nd, over 8,000 Russian troops and 700 armored vehicles participated in the Caucasus 2008 military exercise which took place on the Russian border with South Ossetia and Georgia. Throughout July and until the night of the 7th of August, Russian and South Ossetian troops attacked and bombed over a dozen Georgian-controlled villages using grenades, mortars, and artillery, fired on Georgian peacekeeping forces, and used remote-controlled explosives on Georgian vehicles moving through the area. Russia had two grievances prior to the outbreak of the war. The first grievance came from the increasing success and speed of Georgia's integration with the West, particularly NATO. Georgia's calls for NATO integration worried Russia about the westernization of Georgia and therefore Russia's ability to have cultural, economic, and political influence within its self-declared sphere of influence. For the Russian administration, Losing its sphere of influence was not something that Russia was willing to let go. The culmination of Russia's fears was created by Georgia's calls for NATO membership in 2008. A month before the 2008 NATO Bucharest summit, Russia's envoy to NATO, Dmitry Rogozin, was perfectly frank. 
he told Reuters on 11 March 2008, As soon as Georgia gets some kind of prospect from Washington of NATO membership, the next day the process of real secession of these two territories from Georgia will begin. The second cause of grievance between Georgia and Russia lies in Georgia's success in becoming a way for Europe to bypass Russian energy. Georgia links Azeri oil and natural gas and the Caspian Sea to European markets via the Black Sea in Turkey. All of that, of course, is off of the record. One official Russian statement about the 2008 war was made by Russian Ambassador Vitaly Turkin, who claimed that Russia pursues no other goal but to protect the Russian peacekeeping contingent and citizens of the Russian Federation. Furthermore, Georgia could not justify its operation against the peacekeepers as self-defense necessary to respond to an ongoing or imminent attack by Russia. Therefore, there was an armed attack by Georgia in the sense of Article 51. That means that Russia's military response could be justified, but only if all other conditions for self-defense under Article 51 were met as well. According to the 1992 Sochi Agreement signed between Georgia and Russia, Russian peacekeeping forces were allowed to stay in Georgia's two breakaway regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Russia's peacekeeping forces were intended to be purely defensive in nature, whose primary purpose was to restore peace if violence occurred within the disputed territories. But this taken into consideration, it's important to think about whether the withdrawal of Russian peacekeeping forces would have been more beneficial than sending Russian military forces. And furthermore, considering that Russia was participating in an international peacekeeping operation, whether requests for international assistance would have been more appropriate. One important facet of self-defense is proportionality. Self-defense must be immediate and proportionate to the threat. So when Russian forces made a naval blockade of Georgia, destroyed the entire Georgian Navy stationed in Poti, bombed the Georgian city of Gori, bombed Georgian air bases in Marniuli, Vaziani, Kutaisi, and Dedo Puiskaro, bombed parts of the Bakutsupsa oil pipeline, and destroyed radar stations near Tbilisi. It's nearly impossible for Russia to have any claim to self-defense. Russia also made a secondary claim that it was defending South Ossetian citizens. Approximately 90% of all citizens of South Ossetia had Russian passports. With regard to this latter group of new Russians, it seems abusive to rely on their need for protection as a reason for intervention, because Russia itself has created this reason for intervention through its own policy. The Georgian perspective on the 2008 war is more difficult to assess, mostly due to the complexity of the status of South Ossetia prior to the war. South Ossetia is considered to be an entity short of statehood. As such, the use of force by Georgia to quell conflicts is not necessarily prohibited. However, because Georgia signed the Sochi Agreement in 1992, Georgia was legally bound to prohibit the use of force against South Ossetia. However, Due to South Ossetia's status and a lack of control over its own territory prior to August 8, 2008, July 3rd and August 1st attacks on the Georgian villages of Zemonikozi, Femonikozi, Avnevi, Nui, Ergnet, Eredvi, and Zemoprisi by South Ossetian forces were not under the jurisdiction of South Ossetia before 8 August 2008. The actions by the South Ossetian militia are equivalent to an attack on the territory of another state. Since South Ossetian forces initially attacked ethnic Georgian villages within undisputed Georgian territory, it was therefore permissible for Georgians to use self-defense against South Ossetia. The actions taken against South Ossetia on the night of August 8th, specifically the aerial bombing of Tsukhinvali and the ground invasion of South Ossetia, beg the question as to the true intent of the Saakashvili administration. Taking into account all of these factors, it can be said that the air and ground offensive against Khinvali on the basis of the order given by President Saakashvili was not proportionate and therefore the use of force by Georgia could not be justified as self-defense. The author of the EU's fact-finding report on the 2008 war squarely puts initial blame for the war with Georgia, due to Georgia's firing the first shot when it shelled Khinvali. However, the document also states that this conflict was created by Russian-led antagonism towards Georgia, specifically by granting Abkhazian and South Ossetians Russian citizenship, the Russian military buildup and military exercises in July 2008, 
sending in non-peacekeeping military forces to Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and Russia's long-standing support for Abkhazian and South Ossetian separatists. The nature of the conflict must also be taken into perspective in order to correctly understand the situation to its greatest extent. Although the initial blow was from Georgian troops against Khinvali, the majority of subsequent human rights violations were against ethnic Georgians both within South Ossetia and, in rarer circumstances, against Georgians in Georgia proper. There is ample evidence that South Ossetian forces, both uniformed soldiers and unidentified militia forces, along with Russian forces, undertook a systematic campaign of arson against homes and civilian buildings, such as schools and clinics, in Georgian villages within South Ossetian territory, while there is negligible evidence to support claims of Georgians conducting acts of ethnic cleansing against South Ossetians. Russian claims of defending their own nationals along with South Ossetians were unsubstantiated in the eyes of international observers. Since Russian claims for self-defense were unsubstantiated, the 2008 war can be seen as an act of Russia attempting to regain its lost prestige and regional influence. Prior to 2008, Russia was beginning to lose its hold on its former sphere of influence, which was established under the USSR. Georgia, sharing a direct border with Russia and a close cultural ally due to their Orthodox heritage, had ventured too close to the West, Russia's existential enemy since the end of the Second World War. From the Georgian perspective, Mikhail Saakashvili was dealt a devastating blow at the NATO Bucharest summit. After years of Russian military antagonism and numerous promises of future NATO and EU membership, Saakashvili returned to Tbilisi empty-handed. In an attempt to show the West his ability to take charge, he attempted to recreate his successful integration plan from Achada in 2004 with South Ossetia. He waited for what he thought would be the correct moment, but ultimately miscalculated both the military preparedness of Russia and the willingness of the West to support Georgia's sovereignty. For more information on Georgia's occupied territories and Georgia as a whole, visit our website www.visiting-georgia.com. Thanks for watching.